um, yeah, we're, re we're recording the webinar. Uh, we will send that out um, unless somebody turns around and says, please don't, but um, I just want to make the audience aware of that. Um, the second thing um, that I would like to do is just acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, on which we're meeting. Um, I, I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, um, the Aboriginal elders of other communities um, who we may also have here today. So I just want to do that acknowledgement before we do anything else. Um, I appreciate you, got, you, you all taking the time. Um, I'm going to try and make this as interactive as possible. I'm not going to spend too long on too many slides. I could spend a long time talking about a lot of things. I'm going to gloss over a little bit. But what I do want to call out is the fact that I had a little bit of a, an incident <laughs> recently. For those of you who don't know me, I live on a, on a hobby farm and I was um, catching one of the sheep to cut the sheep's nails on Monday and I got head butted and I've got a little bit of a black eye. So um, please don't uh, don't feel that there's been something untoward there. I do box as well, but I don't. That's not from boxing. That was my sheep who got the better of me. But the good story is that we got her toes cut and she's uh, she's all well. She's a little bit sheepish, but she's all well. So well. Um, so all good. Look, uh, we'll, we'll get on with it. Um, today, I want to talk about the role of HR in addressing the challenges in, in aged and healthcare. Um, I've spent um, many, many years, many, many, many years, um, five or six years working in this sector. Um, I have spent a lot of time in aged care. There is some content in here specific to aged care, but um, there is the general application of what we're trying to do is also something that I've seen work well in health as a general rule. So. Um, some specificity and some broader sort of sort of scenario around that. Um, quickly, we'll do some introductions. Um, I want to talk about some of the trends that are impacting this sector. Um, I want to talk about some specific ways, and it's certainly not an exhaustive list, but there are some ways uh, where we think that HR can impact their organisations. And what I do want to say the whole way through this is that we recognise that these sectors are hardworking sectors. These sectors are areas where people really are doing work of passion. You know, I sit across the table from people in operations and people all over the place. And as a general rule, we're talking to nursing people who are doing work and, and people don't go into nursing for, 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 for self-centered reasons. They do, they go into nursing for a passion piece. So I, I wanna, every statement I make, I want you to understand that what we're saying here is how do we, enable our organizations to enable their people to do the best work knowing that and acknowledging that um, they are already doing amazing work <laughs> there's some really really good work going on, on, on in this place so um, we'll talk about that we'll talk about some of the ways that hr can help um, take that to the next level potentially um, i do have and i'll introduce anna quickly in a minute um, we're going to do an interview with 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 um anna uh, that'll be great. Um, she brings a wealth of knowledge to this space. So I'm really excited about that. And then I've got a Q&A session at the back. Um, obviously, we've got you all muted. Um, I do have some nice people helping me technically in the back end here. So if you've got questions along the way, please put them in the chat box. Um, I won't necessarily see the chat box. So we might hold them till the end or I'm happy for some of my people to interrupt or whatever. But please, if you've got anything you want to talk about, um, Please put it in the chat box. We can handle it at the, at the tail end. Okay, so um, nice and easy. So some quick introductions. Anna, um, Anna Zilli. We'll do a, we'll do a full introduction of Anna shortly because I'm going to present a little bit first, as you can see. Uh, but I'm really privileged to be um, to be working with Anna today. Um, she's she's one of our strategic partners. Um, she's taken the time out out to do this. Um, I can see from just the short time I've worked with her that this is a passion piece for her. So, you know, thanks, Anna. I really appreciate you coming. You know, we could easily roll this out, but you're going to add so much to it. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm that guy over there that when I took that photo, I didn't have a beard, a black eye and grey hair because, you know, we've all been through COVID. <laughs> so I'm that guy. And then I've got Brent online as well. Um, Brent's our senior director for um, products and a whole lot of things. Brent's actually dialed in from the US um, and he's on standby to handle any of those questions. Um, he'll be doing a lot of that work at the tail end. He's, he'll, he'll introduce himself properly when we get there as well. All right, so you're going to have to listen to me for the first 10 minutes. I promise not to talk too much. Um, this is a passion piece for me as well. I've been working in this area for six years, as I mentioned. Um, and, and yes, we're a vendor. We, we do technology. 
Um, but we could have chosen anywhere to do technology. I chose this space because I can see that we can make a difference. Um, and for me, that's what this is really all about. How do we make a difference? How do we impact the people that impact the people? What do we do? So I love this sort of stuff. So if I talk too much, you know, raise your hand and say, move on, <laughs> which is what I'm going to do right now. So um, trends impacting aged and healthcare. Um, pandemic, we'll talk about that. Everyone's tired of talking about that. I've got a couple of other trends in there as well. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about the Royal Commission. We're not going to talk too much about that, but I am going to look at this piece around quality care and what that means. Um, and then the, the last bit is just stuff that I've seen over years. People challenges that haven't necessarily gone away. Um, and they're not bad things. They're just things that we have to deal with. You know, they're just part of the day-to-day -day of running these sorts of operations. We're not sitting in an office as a consulting firm or a bank. We are different. Um, and we have some, some unique um, ways of work that, you know, create some challenges for us. So, you know, let's just acknowledge some of that, that piece. So I've titled this the pandemic response or, or what, have, what have you um, and, and digitization as an accelerator. Now, it's an interesting thing, right? But over time, if you look through, since say the industrial age and all of that piece, we have been adopting technology. We have been um, automating, we've been doing a lot of things with technology that we got to a point recently where that type technology um, probably outstripped human adaptability. Um, and it's not necessarily the smarts, it's just, there's a lot going on. How do we prioritize? How do we do this? You know, I've spent, many years um, sitting with my HR folks and sitting with the CFO, trying to justify digitization and trying to get this to work. But I think a couple of things have happened to be able to change that potentially. Um, obviously we talked about this idea of COVID itself and that has changed it. We still have people on the cold face, um, but we have access issues. We have a whole lot of different things now where no longer is it really okay to have the pen and paper filing cabinet that's out on site you know that doesn't work anymore it doesn't help us bring people in it doesn't help us help people to do their best work but this has now elevated that conversation to the c-suite and the c-suite have gone yeah that's actually great i'm not having to sit there build business cases so much anymore because they're going yeah we get it now we just want to do it i think just prior to that there was the amalgamation of the aged care quality commission and the aged care safety commission Right. And I spent a little bit of time with the commission. Um, and what that meant was you've got the same people who are helping you or telling you what those standards are, who are actually doing the audits now. <laughs> it's an interesting thing because you used to be able to kind of prepare for an audit. You used to be able to say, there's an audit coming, we know what's happening. Now it's spot audits. And they might just turn up to one of your facilities and say, show me the file on ABC person. Now that's fraught with challenge if you're not digitized. So that started to elevate this idea around adopting. Um, and then the Royal Commission, as we've talked about as well, has also created that. So there's been a, it's been a, it's been a storm. <laughs> it's been a storm for the last couple of years, right? What that has meant is that we've been able to help our people to learn and grow faster and do things in a more agile fashion because we're now top of mind, you know? Um, we, we've been able to gain the, the, the backing that we've needed for such a long time and potentially bridge that gap, right? Um, it's a general trend. We're definitely seeing it come through, right? The aged care, and for those of you in health, um, please bear with me. I won't spend too long on this, but there were some significant findings um, through this through this piece, piece of work. Um, the, the recommendations came out saying there should be a rights-based system. So residents would now be entitled to uh, have an input into what quality of care looks like. Um, and I can tell you that some organisations have struggled with that and some organisations have done a really good job at that. And I, again, I say that with, with all, you know, good intent, but, you know, there's, there, how do you do that? Um, and that doesn't even necessarily sit in HR, but how does that work? Um, there's, a, there's a requirement around um, stronger governance to hold providers accountable to that quality of care. And that is a challenge. God, that's hard. That's, that's difficult. Um, better conditions. Um, yeah. I'm not going to spend too long on that because it's just one of those things, you know, there's a bit of to and fro on that. Um, and then, you know, there's just a recognition that a better system will cost more. And we know that the feds came out, gave us some more money, didn't give us everything that was recommended, but did do something. So there's, so there's some good work around that, right? So um, they were the findings. And then 
my last bit is around the people challenges and I could have put 16 things up here. <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to just keep it really simple uh, and some of the major things that I see. So, um, and again, this is not meant as a blunt instrument. This is just a recognition of how we work in a fairly unique way. Um, there's high staff to manager ratios. I've sat in a hospital where um, we were talking around, you know, developing people, growing people, doing all these things. And the manager said, how much time is it going to take? And I said, oh, probably X, Y, Z. And she said, you know, I've got 80 direct reports. I said, was that eight? And she said, no, 80. I've got 80 direct reports. And I kind of smiled. <laughs> I felt like uh, I was in a bit of a challenge. So we're seeing anything from 10 to 20 up to 80. So that just is, is a significant challenge to then turn around and say, I want to be able to do what we're doing in office, say in an office where I've got five or six direct reports and I see them. Um, the, the, the patient to staff ratio thing, I feel a little bit like I'm walking out on a tightrope with talking about that, um, but it's still there and it's still, it comes down to cost, it comes down to a lot of things, but we're still dealing with that, you know? So that's, that's, that's life, um, that, that, that is what it is. Interesting thing though that I've seen is the 24 seven rotating shift piece often means it's really, really hard to manage things face to face because I might, I might report to Anna and because of my shifts, and the way it works, Anna and I actually don't see each other for three weeks. So how does Anna, how, how do we have those conversations around how to do things really, really well? Some of that has, has enabled that digitization piece to work really, really well. Um, and, and sometimes that's just hard, it's just hard. <laughs> um, and then look, at, I think it's fair to say, and I don't wanna say this the wrong way, but I think it's fair to say that there is a bit of a turnover challenge in the sector. Um, it's hard to get people in. It's potentially hard to keep people in. Um, and by no means am I sort of saying it's tough work and it's awful. And some of, some people do their most amazing work in this place, but we still have casualization, we have pay, we have those sorts of things. But as HR, maybe we can do something about that, maybe we can't, but we can certainly help our organisations around the engagement piece. We can do some things to help engage and help um, our, our registered nurses and our people feel like we're connected and part of something that's more than just, I'm a casual who's earning X amount of dollars. Well, that's the bit that I think we can do some work around. How can, how, how can we impact the organisation as a response? Um, simple sort of scenario here. Um, and, I've, and I have talked around this. I don't love this word behavioural management. I didn't know how to put it a better way. The reason I'm not convinced about that is because it sounds negative and I don't mean it that way. <laughs> I mean managing people to do their best work is, is what I'm saying. Right? Um, the two Royal Commission recommendations that I think we can directly handle, or there's some, there's some um, low hanging fruit, if you want to call it that, um, are related to this piece around quality of care and connecting those two things. So um, Aaron and I had some really interesting conversations coming into this. Um, you know, is, it, is it HR's responsibility to define quality of care? Not really, where does it sit? How do we make that work? So, so maybe what HR needs to do is analyze the data um, there's a lot of data points now. Some providers are doing very, very well at this. Some are still struggling a little bit around this. What does quality care mean? Because the standards didn't tell us what quality care actually means. <laughs> it just uses term quality care, right? Um, so maybe instead of us defining what quality care is, we're saying, let's look at those data sets. You know, and Anna can talk a whole lot um, about how, how her organisation has done this. And I think they're they're doing some significantly good work and there's some pieces, there's some nuggets in there that are really, really good, right? Um, so let's take the data and let's analyze that. That's one thing. And then the second thing is let's connect the behaviors of our people to that data set, right? So it's easy to say, um, I've got a certified registered nurse, therefore, it's harder to say I've got a registered nurse who's doing amazing work. And that's not because the registered nurse isn't doing amazing work. It's just hard to grab that data. How do we do that? Traditionally, we haven't done that. And then the second thing we can do once we've kind of got our head around that piece is to then align those behaviours to competencies. You know, and competencies can be anything from you know do things well or whatever. There's a whole there's a whole breadth of, of stuff in there that maybe this audience knows better than I do. <laughs> um, but align those competencies to the behaviours, and then align that to the care. So we're talking around soft skill, we're talking around, but, but instead of it being what it was five years ago, where it was kind of a softy feely sort of thing, we now have the data set. So let's, let's bring them together, all right? And let's, let's work on that. So 
Um, I could unpack that a whole lot more. I feel like I'm walking on um, in, in just potential, you know, challenging questions, right? Um, but that's where I think we can make, we can, we can make, a, make an impact. Um, what I want to do now is introduce Anna. Um, Anna, I might get you to just introduce yourself if that's okay and, and talk a little bit about your background and all of that and I'll stop talking for a sec. Well, thanks, Adrian. Um, before I um, start to introduce myself, I'd just like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we gather and uh, pay my respects to those elders past, present and those emerging and also pay my respects to those who are present today on the webinar. So thanks for joining us. Um, lots of interesting topics you've raised there, Adrian, and gosh, I'll be, uh, let's see where the conversation goes. Um, so I've been with Anglicare for three years now. Um, prior to that, I probably spent a good part of 15 years in Queensland state government. Um, and I guess the interesting piece about that is, and, and Adrian, I think you touched on a little bit, um, people I think who work uh, in this sector and state government, there's, there's a common theme and it's really, um, it, it's an altruistic drive to do, you know, to, to do good for others and to support, you know, our civic responsibility and to help people care. And that's what um, I guess has led me to Anglicare. Um, I've been in an HR background for probably 20 plus years. I think my um, spanned number of different roles in there, but my core background is adult education. So um, that that's kind of the pathway that I took into um, Anglicare. Yeah, fantastic. And look, thanks, Anna. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you, if it's okay. Um, and I guess just hope me now. Sorry, Sorry Anna. <laughs> a bit of a background of Anglicare as well. Yeah, look, if you, if you could, that'd be amazing, please. Yeah, so just, just so that people know who we are and what we do. Um, and look, I guess there's people who are with us today that are probably from many different states across Australia. So um, you may be familiar with uh, your own Anglicare or a similar organisation uh, in your state. Um, Anglicare, there's an Anglicare network and we're a, a group of um, very like-minded organisations across the country. Um, and our purpose is really to support vulnerable people um, and address disadvantage. So it's, it's um, worth noting that we're all separate organisations. We all have our own uh, boards and governance, governance structures and we will provide very different services. So in Early Care Southern Queensland, we, um, we provide aged care, we provide foster care, we uh, support homelessness, mental health and family counselling. For those who are familiar with uh, Queensland, we uh, span services from the coast up to Sunshine Coast White Bay. Uh, we head out to the Queensland uh, West border we have services in Longreach, so that's a pretty long drive, and also up to um, Townsville. Um, and again, just a little bit more context, we, um, in our residential aged care homes, so we have eight of those, we've got about 600 plus residents. And in uh, home uh, and community aged care, we have about 30,000 clients that we support in their homes. So, you know, we look at all, um, people from different stages of life, regardless of their background, who really are experiencing challenges or, you know, entering a, a different stage of life. Yeah, fantastic. Um, significant opportunity for you guys to make an impact, right? Like it's just the breadth and the depth of that, of your organisation is, is significant, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a bit, it's a privilege to be honest, you know, to, to, to do this sort of work, isn't it? Absolutely a privilege. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, great. Um, my first question, um, and we'll see how this goes, but how did how did your organisation weather the global pandemic? How did that happen for you? <laughs> yeah, so Adrian, look, it's probably um it's interesting. So when I think about Anglicare, we've we've got 150 years worth of service and um 
you know, if I look at that history uh, and the pioneers of who Anglicare, uh, who established Anglicare, and it's gone through a number of different um, name changes over that 150 years, but really, you know, we've been showing a great amount of courage in going where the need is um, and through times of, you know, adversity. And for me, that's no different to what we've done during pan the pandemic. So, you know, we continue to show up every day, care for Queensland, care for vulnerable people, people who are disadvantaged, and we put their safety first and we put um, the safety of our staff first. So, you know, I think it's through that history of going, uh, you know, where others haven't that have helped us through the pandemic. Yeah, fantastic. Um, have you had to take any significant journeys, <laughs> anything different that really happened for you over that over over that um, um, that response? Um, it, you know, when I think about um, the executive leadership team, and I think you mentioned that a little bit earlier, we've got, um, you know, a, almost fifty percent of our uh, executive leadership team come from a uh, a health background. So having uh, people who have worked in uh, crisis situations is a really good way to steer a ship through a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having good governance, having good systems, having good support and being able to respond to that really helps navigate through a kind of crisis. Um, I think for HR people, certainly in my professional time as an HR uh, senior practitioner, um, whilst uh, it's nothing that I've personally experienced in my history or probably none of us that have been here today, you, you draw on, on that experience in the past. So we, you know, you, you're, you're transferring your skills of dealing with other major challenges and you apply it to a new context. I think um, having strong leadership, having good governance, um, and having a really solid foundation helps you get through that. Yeah, fantastic. So, you know, I think the message I'm hearing is um, almost that, not, not that it was business as usual, because it wasn't business as usual, but in some way it was business as usual, it's just a different type of business as usual. Um, yeah, well, you, you, you draw on that expertise of being, you know, you've got, um, I think importantly, just also uh, there was lots of, different messages coming out from state and federal government. You know, you've got um, people experiencing uh, pandemic in different ways. So being really consistent, clear, uh, lots of communication, um, you know, even when there was uncertainty in terms of uh, stages as we went through the pandemic, I'm sure, you know, people talked about the supply of uh, PPE as a bit of an issue. So, you know, the more that you communicate, the more that you can just inform people of what's happening and where you're at, even though you may not know exactly what the next stage is, but just relying on those really good principles that we would apply to any sort of crisis situation. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Um, my second question is, I guess, how have you as HR, safeguarded the future for your employees and for the overall organisation? Yeah, so I guess um, it's really important when I, when I think about that question, Adrian, it helps to know who you are and why you exist. And being really solid in that helps you define your future. So if I think through Anglicare's history of 150 years of service, and throughout that time, being deeply, and I stress deeply committed to care uh, and knowing that every person that we touch in our care has their own, they're all individuals, they have their own story, they have their own needs. Um, and, and we do that well, you know, mm -hmm. so, so basing that foundation of what, what we do and what we do well helps us and inspires us to navigate the future and navigate some of those things that we're going to talk about shortly. 
Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, what do you think, in that case, what do you think, um, what's your perspective for what's next? Yeah, gosh. To the industry. <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? It's a bit of a crystal ball, isn't it? But, yeah. um, so, look, some of the, some of the big, uh, if I think about HR, what's going to be on our plate for the next, um, you know, three to five years, you, you've touched on those a little bit, but for me, probably the biggest two are going to be workforce uh, supply and demand. Um, and I'd love to share some sort of stats and data with you on to give you a bit of a picture of what the industry is facing. And the second one, and I'll come back to that stats and data, the second one is yeah, going to be capability. Yeah. And again, you've touched on that, but let me just share with you. Um, so, and, and this data comes from uh, Deloitte reports, there's the Productivity Commission, uh, it comes from our peak bodies. Um, and also, I mentioned earlier about the Anglicare Australian network that sort of represents a lot of the um, member organisations. So, in aged care, uh, we've got some projections about what that workforce needs to look like by 2050. Mm -hmm. So, we need to increase from 350,000 to just under a million by 2050. Significant, so, isn't it? It's big. <laughs> hold your breath, Adrian, hold your breath. Um, the average age of care workforce is around 50. So that's national age. In Anglicare, it's uh, 46. Now, 50% of our current workforce will reach retirement age in the next 15 years. That's huge. That's <laughs> <laughs> just, it's mind boggling, isn't it? So, so if you think about then the, the uh, ageing population, so by 2044, there's going to be 14 times as many people aged 85 or plus. I just did the math because I'm working. I think everybody probably does this. When you mention a year 2044, you go, how old am I going to be? Which cohort am I in? <laughs> what do I have to think about? You know, but... As an organisation, that's just massive, isn't it? That's a really, really big. This is this is the pressure that's happening on on the aged care, you know, sector. Um, so there's a, another interesting stat that I found that over the next five years, there's five years, there's going to be three thousand job openings each month. So when you talk about workforce supply and demand, I mean, this is I've seen one um, organisation who. Um, instead of just hoping they're going to fill those roles, they've started doing um, a much more proactive sort of approach. Um, you and I haven't talked about this, so forgive me. It's just you reminded me of a little story, right? So back in the day, 10 years ago, I was doing grad programs for the big mining companies, right? And those mining companies were going in and working not just at university level, but they were working at high school level to try and get people to select the right courses to be able to build their pipeline, right? I've seen one aged care provider looking at doing that now. They're sitting there going, we know that we can't just uh, borrow someone from another, another provider. We have to build people. So, you know, that's a long, long-term view. Um, they've registered themselves as an RTO. They've done a few things. To me, that's really, really forward thinking. And I guess you've opened this conversation. Forgive me if it's a rude question, but how do you feel like you're going to do this? What... What does it mean for you? What does it mean for Anglicare? Tell me, tell, I would like to ask it if it's too rude, forgive me. But. It's, and uh, this is, um, I guess, one of the things that HR needs to really turn their mind to. So, you know, we, we have this limited supply of talent. Um, I guess traditionally a lot of our workforce has been made up by uh, international or migration and we know that that's a challenge with COVID and border closures so um, there's a lot of different things so that that organizations need to do to be able to address that so so you're looking at um, how do you attract a different cohort of people so rather than uh, I guess fishing in the same pond mm -hmm. looking 
broader. So thinking about a diverse workforce, thinking about diversity of talent. Um, so that's bringing people in through a pipeline and you're right. So it's working with uh, RTOs and schools and universities. Um, but then it's also about uh, the experience that people have. So that retention while they're here. Yeah. So, you know, how do you provide them great education and how do you ensure that they've got really good leaders, um, good career pathways, um, good working conditions and remuneration. So th there's a, it's a multi-factor approach that we adopt to really address some of these workforce challenges that we're all going to be facing in this sector. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, that's obviously a large piece of work. Um, and I'm conscious of time, so, you know, forgive me, but if you had to give the audience one or two takeaways on, on where you think they should be focusing their attention, and again, you know, forgive me, but I'm trying to wrap this up into something that's digestible, what, what would you be saying? Yeah, so think about who you are, what's your value proposition, so what makes you an attractive employer, uh, yep. and, it, and it has to be, people uh, have to experience that when they're, when they're in the organisation. Um, thinking about capability development. So, uh, you know, the Royal Aged Care Commission has called out uh, some areas where we need to grow and develop people. So we talk about some of those more uh, skills and competencies are shifting for mm -hmm. our workforce because of the nature of, um, I guess, the health presentations for older Australians. So that's shifting. Therefore, we need to have different skills and capabilities. Um, and then we need to think about some digital literacy to really, as we move into this kind of virtual e-health kind of landscape, we need to make sure our workforce is well prepared and digitally literate so that we're enabled to provide these contemporary and our productive services. Yeah, fantastic. Anna, thanks so much. I'm going to mm -hmm. kick into Q and A. Um, I've seen a few questions come over, um, and again, I'm conscious of time. We've probably got another ten minutes, um, so let me just move my slide. Um, Brent, I'm going to invite you to introduce yourself as well. Um, you know, I brought you on board to to help me handle some of these crazy questions, right? But um, Brent, do you mind just doing a quick um, introduction of yourself just to give some people a, a bit of an understanding about where you've come from and, and your, I guess, unique skill set? Sure, happy to do so. It's it's a pleasure to be in front of everyone today. I'm speaking to you from a very rainy, stormy Houston, Texas here in the United States. Um, I've been hoping that my power has not gone out so that I can continue to stay part of this program. Uh, my background has been actually to be a customer of not only Skillsoft, but some total uh, for close to 20 years in the industry, but I've switched over to the some total side of the business now. And my role is the uh, Senior Director of Global Business Strategy, which supports our customers in their learning and talent strategies, curating it from my experience, but also I now have the opportunity to curate strategies as I meet with customers around the globe. Uh, puts me also in a pseudo analyst role as I look at what the trends in the market are, uh, particularly as they align with the learning and talent processes. And so everything that Anna has been talking about is, is just spot on for not only the healthcare, um, and it's very interesting to hear the regionality, but a lot of the trends that we see that are regional also boil up to be macro trends globally. So it's very interesting to see, and, and I would hesitate to say that generationally, I think we're looking at two ends of the spectrum when in the numbers that Anna was, was communicating, it's just quite amazing to think. But I also think about the younger generation that's coming in behind it as their needs to support and care for the older generations they have a very different skill set and a very different approach to how they go about working and engaging uh, in their skill development. Uh, and I've, I find a lot of it is very technical, uh, technology driven, and even driven by this device. I, I have my own personal lab of three children to watch and see how they all 
gravitate to certain devices and certain approaches to technology. And it's, it's going to be a very different um, next 25 to 30 years as we see the role of, of how technology is going to interact. It's about efficiency. It's about optimizing the opportunities to find the data, act upon that data very quickly as we've seen. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I've had a couple of, I've had three questions. They're kind of all this, almost the same question, but I've had three questions come through. Um, so how could we utilize a new learning and talent platform um, that would lead to a more personalized patient let me read that again. Uh, it will lead to more personalized patient experiences. Okay, how do, how do we use the platform to be able to impact that, that, that personalized patient or residential experience? Well, I kind of started an answer in the, in the chat, but I would say that to your point on the, I think you said it earlier about the idea of the file cabinets in the paper and the need for data at the fingertips, much like we've seen uh, the pandemic has pushed people to remote uh, locations, the connectivity and the access to the data for meaningful, uh, actionable uh, decisions is, is imperative. And what we're finding the more and more is that when you have data that is accessible by multiple people in a secure fashion, of course, but is able to be quickly analyzed and facilitate those decisions quickly, whether it's assigning someone to a particular role based on a skill set that they have, or finding someone who's ready for the succession into a new role, um, or optimizing what you need to have from a need of a skills to search for and attract, uh, it's, it's all tied back to data. It's also tied, as I was mentioning, to the employee experience of accessing these platforms and systems. So what I've found in my tenure is that the more attractive and the more easy it is to use a platform, the more people will leverage it, use it, and generate data. If you have a platform or a disjointed or broken a system, people aren't going to use it ergo you're not going to get data to derive decisions from so it's kind of a, a chicken and the egg in some instances but reality is is that the more you have these systems in place the more optimized you can be in your delivery and the better decisions you can make in a much rapid fashion yeah okay um how do you drive engagement how do you actually address um there was a question that came from somebody uh, let me just grab it you can see I'm doing three things at once. How, how can we support our workforce in their personal growth and retention strategies and, and that sort of side of things? How, how do we actually do that? It's about providing them something that will actually, they'll use. I, and a lot of it goes back to, again, the form and function. Uh, the term employee experience is coming up more and more. In fact, you know, we, we've heard some of the larger uh, technology companies have, have really started emphasizing that terminology, employee experience. If it is there, people will leverage it. We've already seen at the beginning of the pandemic in March and April of last year, we saw record numbers of people leveraging development opportunities in the three to 400% increases year over year of accessing content and data. People are hungry for development. They will access it or find it wherever they can if you are providing it in a manner that is a pleasing employee experience, something that is similar to a consumer style approach for interacting with an app, with the technology, with the information, the benefit is, is that you get that knowledge and information into your system so you can start to see who you have, really understand the, the potential of that talent you have in your organization. Otherwise, they're going to go somewhere else to find it, and that's going to be data that's lost on your part. Okay. Well, that makes some sense. Um, Anna, would you like to add anything to this conversation, you know, around ease of use or platforms or anything, or is this something that's a little bit left of field for you? Yeah, look, I think um, importantly, you know, uh, if I think about the age of our workforce again, so that, that's the context that we work in, um, we, we need to make sure that there's a, a, a level of digital literacy for staff to be able to interact with 
uh, either a learning system um, or a care system um, and often staff will interact between the two. Um, so it has to be easy. It has to make their job easier. Uh, you know, it's one of the things that I think as HR professionals, um, with everything that we do from a, a kind of a corporate space um, needs to enhance our employees' experience so that they can provide care to our clients and residents. And that's what, it, you know, for me, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, and that makes sense. And, and thinking through my world, you know, when I was talking about things like manager ratios and all of these sorts of things, they're, they're inhibitors, but, you know, we can bridge the gap now if we do it well. Um, if we do it badly, it just go, it, it gets it goes from bad to worse. You know, if you do it badly, so um, so that makes some sense. Look, well, got, and, and I think sorry. to just uh, to 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 add on to what Anna was saying is that when the technology is actually good, when the employee experience is good, it it actually melts away. It becomes part of the process, and you don't even think about it. I mean, most people, when they they get on social media or when they use their their smartphones, they're not thinking about they're using a technology device. They're immediately going to the point of of information gathering, information data access. So when you have the ability to do that in an organization with the tool, if it becomes second nature because it's in a familiar form and function, that enhances the ability to do the, the role that they're in. It, it's providing it. It's it's the best because it's a it's a transparent platform essentially. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, I've got time. I've got two minutes. I've got time for a quick question and answer. It's my final one. Um, how can we support our workforce in their own personal journey through? Uh, through the growth journey and our retention strategies. It's probably the same question, to be honest, but is there anything we can add to that? How can we support our workforce in their own personal growth journey and our retention strategies was the last question that came through. Yeah, so if we, if I kind of think about that in uh, a separate one, you know, two separate answers. So, Adrian, the first part was about helping employees through their own Personal um, growth journey was the term. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, similar to Deloitte has been talking about personalised learning, growth, and all that for years. It's actually arrived. So, you know, I think that's what we're talking about there. You know. Yeah. So, I think you know one of the things that we need to help uh, people do and acknowledge that um, a, a career in aged care or in care can look different. There's many pathways uh, to that journey. So it's, it's about supporting um, employees to gain those skills, to have that clear visibility of what that could look like, and then to help them navigate through that. Mm -hmm. In For terms sure. of retention, I think was the second part to that question. Cool. Um, yeah. It's, that's multifaceted. So it's about culture, it's about leadership, it's about access to uh, career pathways and journeys, it's about that experience that employees have when they're in the organisation. Um, it's about uh, an organisation that lives its values or its purpose or its mission and that people can actually feel that. So all those things, yes, wages and conditions are an important part of retention. Um, but it's all those, it's it's the experience that employees have. Yeah. And look, I think that's a great, that's a great note to end on. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate that. Look, I, I'll ask just, just briefly, Anna, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, anything else that we haven't covered? Anything else that you could be valuable or you feel like we've kind of got to where we needed to get to today? I think we're pretty good. There's probably hours more of conversation we could have on this topic, Adrian, but... But today, I think that might... Um, That's might. enough to get us started, right? So um, I appreciate your stats on workforce supply and demand. Yeah. Um, I wrote some notes down. I've, I've worked out how old I'm going to be in 2044. <laughs> All those things. So, look, you know, I'll um, a quick shout out to obviously yourself, Anna, and Brent, um, for both of you, for, for participating. We really appreciate that. Um, there's a whole crew sitting in the background of our business that's helped us to get to this webinar today. So I really, really appreciate that as well. Um, we will 
send out a recording um, and some content um, off the back of this to, to the people who've registered. Um, you know, uh, if there's anything that anybody would really like to talk about or, or, or anything, obviously that comes back through us, you know, we can, we can help. Um, we're more than, more than happy to sort of continue the conversation on um, and all of those things. And I appreciate your time. Brent, appreciate your time as well. So thanks, thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay.